Hello and welcome to YEP's Women Power Hour virtual panel discussion. My name is Aster and I serve as the YEP's Communication Director. We have a very special program lined up for you today, <clears throat> but before we get into the discussion, I would like to encourage you all to follow us on all of our social media uh, platforms and encourage you to check out our website. YEP is a 501c3 nonprofit based in the greater Washington the, uh, Washington area, and we serve the community through tailored programming on personal and professional development. YEP's Women Power Hour is one of our many programs that highlights diaspora achievements and specifically highlights women in, the, in their various professions. We're super excited to have our speakers today, and with that, I'll turn it over to Mahali. Thank you Thank so you. much, Mahali. My name is Mahalit Makonin. I am the Diaspora Engagement Lead for YEP and the President of the Ethiopian American Bar Association. We have an amazing pair of panelists with us today. I will start first with Lule Demise, who is the President of Ally Invest. As President of Ally Invest, she's responsible for Ally Invest Securities, Ally Invest Advisors, and application programming interface business lines. She is responsible for the products and services delivered to Ally's all digital client base, the shaping of the client experience, and the management of the profit and loss statement and growth strategy for the business. Prior to joining Ally Invest, Louie was the managing director of investments, products, and digital guidance at TD Ameritrade. And prior to that, she worked for leading investment firms such as Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, and Marin Lynch as product manager, product developer, and a financial advisor. As a financial executive with a range of intersectional identities, Lule is a woman of color and a member of the LGBTQ community, to, me, to name a few. She has a perspective that is much needed and not often represented in the financial services community. We also have with us today attorney Mulu Mebe Alemayo, affectionately known as Mulu. Mulu has been ex exclusively practicing immigration law since 1993 and founded her own immigration law firm in 1998. Her firm, Law Offices of Mulu Mebe Alemayo PC, is currently based in Los Angeles, California, and provides representation to immigrants nationwide. Mulu provides representation to immigrants coming to the U.S from all over the world and has an extensive court litigation experience with her main areas of practice being removal, deportation, defense of detained and non-detained immigrants, family-based immigration, and asylum. She's involved in a number of community-based organizations that provide assistance to immigrants. She also performs humanitarian work at the U.S.-Mexico border, assisting asylum seekers that are seeking to obtain refuge in the United States. Mulu is a founding executive board member of U.S. Africa Institute and a member of the American Immigration Lawyers Association. Lule and Mulu, happy International Women's Month. We're coming up at the end. Uh, thank you for both for taking the time to be here with us today. I know that your time is valuable as you two are very impressive women. Uh, the bio is just a, a snapshot of uh, what these ladies do and we will link in their full bio and the program here. Um, I also just want to say, even though this is a virtual room, I can feel the power and I'm excited for our discussion and conversation uh, today. Um, before we dive in, <clears throat> given that we are in a unique position to have with us uh, a leader in the financial technology fintech space and a, an attorney uh, and owner of the law firm, I thought I would start with um, highlighting very important statistics about your respective fields. Mm -hmm. A uh, Harvard Review, Harvard Business uh, Review article notes that fewer than 2% of tech executives and only 5.3% of tech professionals are black. Um, and uh, as you can imagine, the women is less than that. Uh, according to a study released by the National Association for Law Placement in the legal profession, minority students make up about one fifth of law school graduates yet they constitute 7.5% of firm partners with black women making up just 0.75% of law firm partners. And uh, this applies also to um, people in the general counsel stage, 9% of general counsel for large corporations and only 2.5% uh, were women of color. Um, so with those sobering statistics out there, uh, let's get started with our first question. Uh, we're coming, uh, as I said, we're coming to the end of Women's History Month. So I want to start with how your 
diverse background shaped your respective roles, including how it has influenced your successes and challenges, and how it impacts the way you handle day-to-day -day operation. And I will start with you, Lule, uh, if you could share with us how your multi-layered background has shaped your role as a leading woman in FinTech. Well, first of all, um, it is lovely to be with you. Salam to everybody. Um, I'm honored to be with you. I, uh, I find it to be the greatest use of our time is sharing these kinds of virtual insights and knowing each other and supporting each other. So I'm very grateful to be here. Um, in terms of how my background shaped uh, where I am, I often tell people, which is probably common for everybody, every human, but it's extra crispy when it comes to a person that has multi-identities, uh, which is that eventually you discover that your difference is your superpower. And so I spent a good amount of my career covering what was the uncoverable, whether it was the only woman in the room, uh, the only black person in the room, uh, the gay person, which was coverable, um, and spent so much of my time covering that did not realize that all that covering was taking away from the energy of just being um, and being good at what I was doing. Um, so once that sort of phase of the covering stopped and it was about tapping into all these identities that really provided me uh, a connection point, a bridge and tunnel, if you will, on connecting with a myriad of people. Um, we were immigrants. We left with uh, little in our, in our pockets with my parents when they fled Ethiopia. Um, we left for, and lived in many different places. By the time I was 18, I had grown up in, you know, almost like four continents. Um, uh, I, was a, I was a diagnosed dyslexic, you know, like this was like all things that should write you off, right? Um, I, um, I'm gay and I didn't come out uh, for, until, you know, late in my adulthood, um, early adulthood. Um, and so there were lots of things that were uh, things that made me more resilient because of all this but at the same time took so much energy because there was so much covering. And what I recognized um, once I stopped covering, uh, because there was really no covering, everybody knows who you are. It's not, it's a waste of time hiding who you are. Everybody sees it right away. Um, is you then spend your time tapping into this like amazing tableau of experience that you have. And suddenly you become a multifaceted problem solver in the room, a multifaceted connector in the room, um, a person that can see different perspectives in the room. And that is a power to have in any form of business. Um, and so I think that my identity not only affords me empathy, but actually the secret power. I wish more people could view their diverse background as a superpower because it is. Um, and, and your field and, and Lulu's field, uh, actually my field as well in the legal profession, um, it, it's it's very stark. And, you know, on that note, Mulu, being in a profession where you are the minority, um, how do you use that as a superpower and share a little bit with us about how that's influenced your, obviously, your career trajectory, owning your own law firm, as I cited the statistics earlier, that's uh, very rare uh, for women and for women of color, but also for an immigrant as well. Um, thank you, Mahlet, and uh, thank you all of you, and thank you for inviting me to be a part of this discussion, and uh, really an honor to meet you, Lule, and uh, really nice uh, to, to be able to have this discussion, and uh, wow, Lule, I, I applaud you for your honesty and your openness and uh, what you have achieved and how your background really has given you the resilience is what's so important in being able to celebrate um, women and uh, what what a fitting um, uh, story really for Women's Power and uh, International Women's Month. So having said that, in terms of um, what has really shaped um, me and into who I am uh, is, is very diverse. And I think uh, it's diverse uh, because of the fact that I, not only did my culture, my family, and my school and my education um, 
shaped me into who I am, but also uh, being a woman and having to go through what I have gone through and being able to uh, start my own practice in a totally different country that I was not born in or did not have a lot of support um, uh, has been very uh, character shaping, I should say, for, for me. Um, so the diversity that I grew up in, in terms of um, having gone to an American school, but then coming out of an American school environment, and the minute I walk out of that gate, um, going into a community and a culture um, that's uh, different than the American culture, uh, and having to adapt to that, as well as having to adapt to a socialist country, which I grew up in, and the human rights violations in terms of the oppression, not only as, as women, but also on, on different levels, um, was also shaping in terms of being able to come out as a resilient of, uh, person and, and, and fight and to understand that uh, uh, these human rights violations and uh, these uh, inequities that we see, whether it's gender-based or race-based or in, in any other um, uh, category we may want to put the inequity in, are things that we should not accept and that we would have to fight. So I think um, having to grow up to adapt to all the different um, environments that I was in growing up uh, has led me to be able to uh, not also come to the United States and, and, uh, and be defeated, uh, but to never give up and to keep going and to build and to always find a way to be able to persevere. Um, so that's that's really what has really shaped me and being able to come out and uh, not uh, be held back by the status quo, uh, but uh, find my niche and uh, be able to come out, you know, um, owning my own uh, practice for so many years. Thank you. And I will turn the mic over to Aster, who has another question for both of you. And uh, well, we'll go from there. Um, so uh, before we go to the next question, I want to say thank you both <laughs> so much for um, agreeing to be a part of this panel and then also being open and sharing your stories. Um, one of the things that we really try to do with this event is to make sure that we have a diverse group of folks on the panel, whether that means like sector, whether that means you're born here in the US or back home, um, being home Ethiopia, or um, if you, you know, different routes in education, um, things like that. We really try and make sure that we find uh, speakers who are able to tap into that. So we're really happy to have you both. I just wanted to reiterate that. Um, so one of the things about this event, it's usually in person, um, but obviously COVID has completely changed the game and now we're using different platforms to really connect. So my next question, the next question, um, COVID-19 is changing the way work gets done. Telework, skeleton crews, uh, social distancing are the new norms. And many organizations, these new norms of working are affecting interactions with colleagues and clients. Um, how is the pandemic affecting the way you two operate at, um, within the business, at home, in the workplace? And how do you maintain connections, um, whether that's with uh, loved ones or folks at work? Like, how do you set boundaries up? So if you could speak through some of those things. And um, I think we start with Lube first. We'll start with you, Lulu, first, and then we'll switch over. OK. So for me, um, really, uh, the pandemic has changed the way I interact, especially with my clients, as well as also with the courts, um, because um, everything was either telephonic um, or, um, you know, being able to use Zoom. And I think it actually brought me to <laughs> the current century of using different social medias also to be able to, to reach my clients. For example, I have started with a couple of my very good friends and colleagues doing you know, monthly or bi-weekly type of uh, webinars where we try to reach our clients by informing them of the new changes. So um, really um, understanding that even though we cannot see our clients or our targeted group in person, we would need to adjust um, by doing it through social media. 
And uh, it also actually, I feel, has made it a little bit more efficient for myself because in Los Angeles, um, I used to spend quite a bit of time commuting back and forth with all the traffic and the distance and so forth. So that commute time I have been able to use really to get more work done and be caught up. And I also uh, feel it has um, made the court systems a bit better as well because um, at some point the court systems and in, in immigration law in the immigration courts it's unprecedented that they allowed some filings to be done via email they allowed uploading of documents um, they allowed the telephonic appearances where you know the government attorney the judge myself could be even in totally different states but are able to conduct our our hearings so it made it a much more efficient way of uh, of um, doing, uh, you know, of uh, having the cases still going and having uh, the practice still going. A little bit of the difficulty for me was in terms of some of my clients who may not be very uh, social media oriented or tech savvy and being able to get a lot of their documents from them. Uh, so I've had to adjust to that as well. And uh, also it, it kind of creates a little bit of a disconnect since people are also, you know, always with the face mask. So there's times that I take off my face mask and I say, this is what I look like, at least so that my new clients would know who I am the next time, you know, we meet in court or we meet in at an interview. But uh, I think um, uh, the, the adjustment that I've had to make uh, hasn't been too bad. And uh, uh, at times I feel it actually made my practice a little bit more efficient. So um, for me, it's been interesting. So I'll start with the work part of it. So we are a digital company. Ally Invest is a digital investment shop. So everything you would do would be through our .com or our app, or you can call us, right? Um, and in terms of our business model, it's a deliberately digital company. Um, so in other words, we have deliberately made the decision not to have bricks and mortar, if you will. Um, and so this pandemic, you know, as you can imagine, if you're a, a business like that, it's wind on your back, right? Has really sort of accelerated in terms of engagement of our customers and customer base. So, and then you add to that the fact that we are in the investment business, and you know what's been happening there, right? In terms of the immense level of engagement and in investing that the pandemic has also driven among retail investors. And so it's been a double sort of wind in our back sort of event in terms of the kind of business we have. Um, and then in terms of how we create productivity and engagement among our, our you know, associates and our teammates, that piece of it took a hot minute, uh, especially when everybody was also a teacher, a nanny and everything else in between. Uh, but ultimately, we figured out um, by structuring uh, and leaning into some of our own leaning um, of lean, what we call lean in, in our industry, which is in any industry, frankly, lean practices, which are really about like structured ways of organizing your work um, and engaging with your teams and problem solving. And we really leaned into those um, and leveraged to them because they became the mechanism with which we can either do problem solving, uh, vet through issues, do some show and tells associated with it. So uh, that really helped us stay engaged as a team, but at the same time, free up some time for people who needed to step out and be a teacher for half an hour or whatever else that they needed to be. Um, so th those are the things that sort of are both beneficially and otherwise um, we uh, developed because of this pandemic. And I would say the digitization of work is here to stay. I think it'll be interesting to see how, as we become a little bit more hybrid in our world, um, how that evolves as well. Uh, but th there are many, many gains made from the digitization. People are not spending you know, their lives on logistics like driving and flying and all this other stuff. And they can really sort of, it's between like their local community and family and the work that they do. Um, personally, um, you know, as, as you can imagine in my career, I do a lot of traveling. Um, and so this is the first year that I haven't traveled. My children see me, my wife sees me on a regular basis. Um, it was interesting at the beginning, but we love it. Um, you know, uh, I'm much more rooted in my local community. I live in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I know my neighbors much more now. Um, 
let me hang out with people in the neighborhood more. So it's also rooted me to, to a microcosm of a community, which is really interesting as well. I love New York City at large, uh, but it's also been just a different way of appreciating New York. And then the other thing that's been interesting, like uh, like the old days when we didn't have, when we had all the time in the world, um, it's helped me also develop some fun skills. Like I don't know how to play the piano and I taught myself how to play the piano. Uh, I learned how to ice skate. Uh, so it's been also fun to be able to expand um, fun sort of hobbies that I could have. And then like broadly speaking, um, it's also been a moment of, you know, introspection and how uh, so much of our societal fissures um, are accentuated in a way that sort of somebody like me who can have that privilege of staying at home and working digitally, you know, somebody else who does not, whether because they're an essential worker or they have to go in, but there's no other way, whether, you know, they're doctors or nurses, there's no other way of doing their, their work. I have relatives that live that life, right? Um, that have to, they have not stopped since the pandemic began. Uh, siblings that have not stopped since the pandemic began and being physically putting themselves at risk. So it's also been a moment to understand how uh, we have to all be each other's keepers in the way we shape our society um, and knowing that, you know, there are some benefits that have happened through this digitization, but there's also the caring of our broader sort of familial and societal structure that we have to think about that the pandemic's fissures have made more clear. I was happy to take a second to see if I'm on mute. But thank you both for sharing. Um, hearing about the different ways that you all have adjusted and have been flexible. I think that's truly um, innate to women. But, you know, I think we've just been able to really um, just uh, be flexible and change of how things are supposed to uh, happen each day. So thank you for sharing those stories. Um, Absolutely. Um, it's always interesting also to hear what people have, what new skills that they've developed over the past year. I will say, I started making injera. No one believes me, but I have, I've baked over, I would say five times, um, FaceTime my mother and learn how to do it. So if anything comes out of this is that I have bragging rights. Um, but uh, I want to go back to what Mu said. Um, about the status quo and operating with the within the status quo earlier and um, women especially women of color um, when we enter a field that is not diverse like your respective fields um, like within the fintech and legal industry we feel we have to adjust to the status quo to fit in because oftentimes the status quo does not make space for women and women of color in particular black women and for the women that are starting out in the fintech space or legal profession, what are the lessons learned that you would impart on how to find their unique voice, pull up a seat at the table, and be able to be leaders within their field? And I'll start with you, Lule, and uh, um, I'm sure there are a lot of people out there that, that would love to get some tools to, to help them along the way. Yeah. I mean, I'd say the first thing I tell a lot of um, women is um, the, you cannot be scared of failure. I think a lot of times, you know, our responsibility of like, oh my God, you know, I'm a person of color and I have to show up well and I can't fail. And if I fail, that means it's, I'm, I'm letting down the whole race. Right. Um, and all that while is, it, it is a fact in the sense that we have to carry that with us is an obstacle to learning the most important thing, which is the art of failing and the art of failing and learning from that failure. And so the one thing I tell people is like, fail early. Do not be cautious in the, in the sense of, let it be that you lost out because you tried something and it didn't work out rather than forfeiting um, the chance. And the reason you didn't fail is you, can never, you never entered the game, right? So that's the first thing I tell people is like, there's no such thing as, people of color have to fail less than others because you will never the only way to acquire skill and to get good is to try out new things uh, so that's the one thing i tell people is like flex your muscles when you're younger try out different professions try out different projects when you're being pulled into something like a stretch project and you feel like i'm not i'm gonna fail at this uh, really leaning into it is important the second thing i tell people is um you know ultimately um confidence not bluster but confidence is really appealing to any industry. Um, and so one of the things about, that's the interesting thing about confidence is it's not earned until you failed a lot. <laughs> 
because the real sense of confidence is because you've seen a thing or two, right? You've tried a thing or two. And so confidence begets success. But in order to get that confidence, you have to not be, you have to be willing to fail. Uh, so it's a little bit of a double edged sword, but it kind of makes sense in general. Uh, so that's one thing I, you know, I tell people is sort of like, become an expert by doing more by partaking more. Um, don't psych yourself out and saying I'm the only person in this room because it's it's easy to get psyched out. Um, there are times and in in I'm in a meeting and I, I forget I'm the only black person. That was not the case in my career. Um, but now I'm in the positions is to make sure that I'm not the only black person, right? So that one of the responsibilities that I have of this privilege is to make sure that I advance uh, inclusion uh, by the time I've retired and I've left. So one is not to be intimidated by being the only person in the room uh, and have a sense of yourself and, and, and it's okay if you fail. Um, and the second is just making sure that you have that servant leadership mentality of knowing that you have to leave the room better than you found it, uh, which means you have to open the doors much wider than they were available to you. Oh, sorry, I, I didn't hear you for a minute, Mahalit. <laughs> um, I, I thank you so much, Lule. Um I was on mute, uh, but um, Lulu, um, would love to hear your, your thoughts as well. Okay, so on my, um, one one thing I wanted to say real briefly about the, the pandemic, actually, what uh, uh, something that I really miss, um, you had uh, mentioned earlier, Mahalit, the border work and uh, the closing of the border and not being able to be out there and uh, to reach a lot of the people that needed our help, especially in the last administration has been very challenging. So that part is the part that wasn't efficient at all in my practice, I should say. Um, but when it comes to, um, you know, as a woman or as a black woman, um, being able to get into the status quo or or be the, not accept you know the status quo as uh, not inclusive not being inclusive of uh, women or women of color or black women um, I think what has helped me in um, not even giving that a thought or or a place really in in my um, uh, in, in my um, how, how should I say in my journey in my journey in my career. I think is really the upbringing that I had and the level of confidence that my uh, parents raised me with. Um, my father uh, was a very liberal and very loving, open uh, person that um, always held my mom as his equal. And I never saw at any time in my home that my mom was treated any different. And she had the same say as him. She had the same privileges as him. He always felt all of us um, should have that type of privilege. And my mother always instilled in me in saying that I should not be relying on anybody for anything, whether it's uh, financial, whether it's advancement in my career. And she thought, uh, even though herself, she was not, um, uh, you know, at a, educated, she always felt it was very important for me to be educated. And um, she always held education and um, being independent at a very high um, standard for all of us that uh, in the family that I think that kind of a bringing is what I try to portray into the community or into anybody that, that I um, encounter in trying to instill that type of feeling in them. Because if you grow up, uh, or if you yourself take your confidence, become very confident, and um, you walk with that confidence, and you think only of what uh, of doing the best that you yourself can do, I think you will not recognize any of the uh, biases, or, or even though you recognize them, you won't give them uh, the uh, power to be able to pull you down or to not achieve what you need to achieve. So really empowering yourself with education, empowering yourself with um, uh, this positive uh, outlook of yourself or being confident about what you do, um, and not really looking at anything as when you walk in and wanting to do something as oh, I'm walking into this as a woman as a black, or as a black woman, but just walking into it as a human being and uh, walking in there with the same feeling of 
I can do this as everybody else is do, uh, is able to do it as well in whatever environment I'm in goes a long way. Because if we look at a lot of um, the factors that we think that society or the labels that society may have on us, I think we give it too much weight and we allow it to pull us down um, by giving it too much recognition. So that's, that's what I think is uh, helpful in being able to uh, not, per, you know, let per se this status quo pull us down because what is the status quo? Uh, I think we should define what the status quo is and that and defining that status quo really comes with the confidence and uh, the education, um, educating ourselves and uh, and striving to be the best that we can and bringing that forth to the society and environment. Well said, both of you. I mean, um, ultimately, it is to take up space, right? You said, what is the status quo, Mulu and uh, Lule? You talked about you have to, to fail to succeed. And it's all about having the confidence, whether or not someone gives you a seat at the table, you take up that seat. And so um, I hope that as uh, young women and uh, black women, um, women of color, immigrants look at this um, and discussion that they see that they have the power and they have the strength to to be leaders in uh, whatever sector that they're in. So I appreciate both of your uh, input on this and I will pass the mic over to us there. Thank you both for your responses. So one of the things um, that I picked out from the last question, I think it was from Lule's response, um, was speaking about this, uh, responsibility to make sure there are other folks in the room so you're not the only and that you're able to sponsor other people's um, uh, careers in these different spaces. So with that said, I kind of have like a three-part question. It's uh, around mentorship. Um, so one, I would love to know um, what did mentorship look like at an early age for both of you and then how has it evolved um, now and also how do you both practice mentorship or are you mentors in the community? Um, in your respective fields. And, uh, Do you want me to start? Or? You can start, yeah. Uh, so I think, you know, in your early years, um, you know, mentorship has several components to it, right? One is somebody's just giving you the ropes and telling and giving you wisdom and sharing that wisdom or even act tapping into their um, their equity, their social equity to, to give you access or to say so-and-so will teach you. So in the early years, it's as much about learning from somebody else's skills and mentorship as well it is to gain from their equity, if you will. Um, I think as you get older, um, one of the things I remember when I turned 40, I realized I had mentors who were younger than me as much as I had older than me. And that's important. Um, you know, I feel really strongly that, you know, at the end of the day, age is but a number and if we continue to acquire knowledge but we stay opal, open and malleable in our learning that essentially you know mentorship can found to be in different places i mentor and and help people uh, with their careers young folks who are coming after me i I'd advocate and champion my peers. I, you know, I'm constantly championing peers and and people who are around me. Um, and I also seek out mentorship from people who are more seasoned than me or younger than me, as I said, because they they keep me sharp and smart. Um, and so that makes me, you know, keeps my skill set and my eyes more relevant. And I'd say, you know, the one thing I, I would say to you people is like, you know understanding your identity, being confident about your identity is really important. So I in no way feel like it's important for me to recognize that I am a black woman and people perceive me um, the way they do because I'm a black woman or that I am gay. But what I do think is important is there's a difference between the recognition and the embrace of your identity versus if the identity is the only framework through which you see life. And that's where I think, you know, it, having those two things be true is really important. In other words, how to embrace your identity, how to be living in it and, and, and sort of, as you say, taking up space. But at the same time, it not being any one part of my identity is not everything about me. Right. And so allowing myself that malleability to be different things is very important for my personal growth and my relevance in my profession. Um, and as a parent, as a, as a wife, as everything else. 
And I'd say, you know, the one other thing I tell people is like mentors come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, one of my favorite mentors has had a completely different life than I did. He was a golf playing Connecticut, you know, country club member. And yet he and I were soulmates and he was the very important mentor in my career and shaping it and bringing me along um, as my as my sort of progression took place. I had mentors who were women. I had mentors who were black. So I would say like the other thing I'd say is, you know, it's important to find your kin, if you will, your uh, people who have your life experience, but it's also important to find mentorship and people who don't uh, because it always allows you to expand and stretch yourself in different ways. Um, mentorship, I think, is actually um, a very um, important um, factor for a lot of people who are really uh, starting their profession or for a, a lot of young adults, um, because it it really is taking somebody under their your or taking somebody under your wing and really showing them the ropes, um, which is something that I felt I really didn't have in uh, establishing my practice. And because I didn't have it, and I felt like I just jumped into the practice and I just um, really taught myself, um, I value how much um, my being able to provide that mentorship uh, is is important. So I value the, the, the need to have that connection with, with somebody. So as much as I can, even though as a sole practitioner, I might not have a lot of the time to be able to invest into it. But as I get older and, and as I get into more of the retirement <laughs> uh, uh, road, then I think a lot more of uh, being able to, uh, in the future, get into a lot of mentorship uh, situations. But even, even now, as a sole practitioner, anybody that reaches out to me, any young adult or any law school student or anybody who's interested in coming with me to the courts and uh, seeing how things are done or being in my office and and um, you know seeing how I um, interview clients or put the documents together um, and so forth I mean I'm happy to always allow them to do that uh, and also to in a lot of my community service uh, I try to pull in a lot of youth and mentor them in showing them, uh, you know, what is out there and the needs that are out there of people that need their assistance and their help and um, how to be able to provide that humanitarian type of assistance. But mentorship, I think, is something that everybody should, uh, like Lule said, um, find um, that peer or that what they what they really would like to do and be able to to reach out and when you work with mentorship to never be afraid to reach out to that person that you want to mentor you or you feel you benefit from being mentored by uh, because that person could really be there and happy to provide that to you i think sometimes for me when i look back it may have been really my own fault of where i was shy to reach out and where i was afraid to intrude but if anybody came to me now, I would never feel like they're intruding into my space or into what I, I could hopefully um, assist in mentoring. So uh, that what I would like to uh, really say is uh, to people to never be afraid to reach out and to ask for, for um, that guidance. You know, I would love to add one thing, which is like, um, this is appropriate that I'm giving you this story in this setting because I've never said it in an Ethiopian setting, so it's awesome. <laughs> um, my grandmother, whose name was Gadis Tesama, had a wonderful saying, and it's actually apropos that we're talking about it in mentorship. She used to say, well, equity, um, whatever that form of equity comes in, your political capital, your skills, your network that you afford somebody, your wisdom that you impart. So a mentor, in essence, is imparting equity on somebody, right? Um, and she used to say equity, um, in whatever form it comes, is like manure. Mm -hmm. It places in one place and it sticks up the joint. You spread it around, things grow. <laughs> ah, I like that. I like that. Your grandmother is a nice woman. <laughs> Very wise. I will be cloning that. that is <laughs> I'm, really I'm so like glad that. I was able to use it in this setting. <laughs> yeah. it, it, made, it made like a <laughs> <laughs> Oh my Love it. Yeah, I love it.
for sure. <laughs> that. I, 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 mentorship, um, especially um, at different points in your career, can really change the tra- trajectory. Just having someone to talk to, having someone to bounce your ideas off of, and just to see how they've done it and how you can do it, it, it really does shape a, um, a person's career and just honestly life. So thank you both for sharing those tidbits. Um, so we do have a couple more questions. It'll be kind of like, not rapid fire, because you may have to think a little bit about them, but we wanted to make sure that we did ask you because uh, a lot of the material that we, um, or the things that we hear from folks who participate in this really uh, impact our listeners. So we want to make sure that we uh, do our due diligence and ask some questions that we know that they would ask if this was an in-person uh, event. Um, so Mahali, I'll ask the first one and then we can ask the second one. But the first one is, um, can you think of a moment in your career that was really pivotal um, to you in terms of uh, changing the course of your career? Like, was it a moment that you had where your mind broke down? And was it a moment where you had an aha moment? Can you think through um, a moment in time that, that really changed the direction for you, for both of you? And um, I know this wasn't on the Q&A before, so whoever would like to go first can definitely chime in. <laughs> Mulu, I'll let you go this time. (laughs) (laughs) Um, In terms of, you know, um, how I initially went uh, into this career path in terms of choosing the area of practice, I think being an attorney, I've always wanted to be an attorney. And I didn't even know that I really um, portrayed it so much that I wanted to be an attorney until I looked at my um, high school yearbook and it said Lady Law. And I was like, I never knew that I was really portraying that uh, all the time that people they even picked it up to give me that label. So, but I think what made me want to become an attorney is is uh, the um, you know violation of human rights that I grew up witnessing in Ethiopia, and the fact that um, there was no due process in anything, and it was just this blanket persecution where you had no recourse. You had no place to go to to be able to um, have somebody listen to you and protect those human rights. And I mean, real inherent human rights. And growing up in that and the helplessness um, I saw all around me is what really always made me say that I am going to go into law. And I knew I was going to do something having to do with humanitarian uh, law. Uh, But the aha moment for me to go into immigration law really came into play when I was in law school and uh, I was the research assistant for my um, immigration law professor. And I really felt uh, what I was learning and what I was researching and what I was finding is uh, really the area of law that I wanted to be in. And this is really what I wanted to do. And uh, even my sense of insecurity that I had when I didn't have the permanent residency in the United States and the fear that I always had of being returned, um, uh, I felt, um, you know, I felt empathy for everybody else that was going through it. So that really made me want to to pursue it. Uh, And also in uh, removal defense and deportation defense, uh, I have to tell you the story. My first client was my own brother in immigration court. Um, So uh, it, it was, it was very, um, personal to me and very personal for me to to be able to make sure that my brother stayed and, and that he deserved to stay in this country. So um, every time that I go out and I fight for clients or I'm in a courtroom, um, I think that feeling is always there of where you really understand why you're doing it. And, and those are my aha moments in life, I guess, that have kind of directed me to where I am right now. So, so first of all, let's be clear. People like Mulu are the reason why we all have a chance of going into heaven. So that's what they're like. Uh, my wife also is in human rights, and I always joke that she's really our ticket to heaven. Um, so ultimately, you know, I, I really admire people who dedicate their lives to human rights um, issues. It's really important. Um, 
I, you know, for me, uh, what was very interesting about, um, you know, did I have an aha moment? The interesting thing is, I think if you try out a lot of stuff, you end up having a lot of aha moments. And then what it really becomes over your career is that you're constantly like sort of pivoting a little and you're course correcting different places because you're trying out, you're putting different inputs into your equation. So I'd say it's not so much a singular aha moment as it is you know, the moments that gave me the most amount of learning and satisfaction because I actually excelled at them. And then the moments that I failed badly at or the moments that out of my control, something bad happened, right? Like I was an H1 during 9-11 and I, my employment was at risk, right? Because companies were laying off people. So either externalities that you have no control over or because you leaned in, either you succeeded out of that or you failed. Those moments, those inflection moments probably gave me the most ahas in my life. Um, but in general, I'd say, you know, I've had, I've been blessed to have lots of ahas because of the fact that I wanted to partake. The thing that I learned very uh, early in, um, in my life is that I am very much like an intellectually curious person. Um, and, and so finance and the way money um, really drives so much of our society. And I don't mean it in any nefarious way. I have no, it's not a good or a bad thing. But this, the way that it governs so much of our society and the capital markets at large really was interesting to me. And I felt as, as you know, for, as a person of color and a woman, I felt like it's important if we want to have influence that I get to know what this thing is and how it runs. And if I'm interested, partake in shaping it and um, and shaping products and services that matter to people that could help people engage in this thing. You know, whether we like it or not, um, the capital markets are an important means of developing nest eggs, uh, developing wealth for people. Um, and so not partaking in it is forfeiting a really important part of our ability to gain assets so we can retire with some peace of mind, right? Uh, and so it was really important for me to be on the inside helping design those capabilities, uh, shaping them in a way that made the room bigger for the investors, not just for the people that are employed by us. Um, and so for me, the aha moment is knowing that I wanted to be in a place where I was always intellectually uh, sort of satisfied and uh, my curiosity could be fed, but that I could do something that was bigger than me. Thank you both for those responses. I, one of the things that I noticed is like it was very personal journeys, um, especially when you for you, like having that moment to be able to be there for your brother. And then also for you, Lula, being able to be in spaces where you can learn about this um, syntax and how you can also create up space for other folks to come in. It just seems like it's a lot of a personal plug, like it's a personal journey for both of you and that you've had many um, pivots throughout. So thank you both for sharing. Um, and then Mahali, I think you have an initial question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I want to echo Astaire's point. I mean, you can sense the passion as you tell your story and your journey. And you don't find that a lot after practicing a certain uh, practice for a while. So it, it's incredible to hear that. And, you know, my question would be, obviously, you've come a long way and you still have a long ways to go. But um, if you would look back um, at your journey and you um, a young you, um, what is one piece of advice that you would give your younger, your younger self? The same advice I'm sharing here, right? Lean in, make mistakes early. Uh, you know, uh, don't let your own mental psyching out, right? Thinking that I don't belong really trip you up. You know, focus on just being in the moment, learning what it's the moment is affording you. Uh, reach out to people and um, create networks for yourself and mentorship and learn from others. We are not individuals alone. We are part of a network of society and learn how to give to that society and learn how to sometimes tap into its equity to give back to you. Um, so it's not that dissimilar that I give the, the folks we're talking to right now. I'd say the, the difference, however, is, you know, it's not quite, it doesn't quite sink in until you've done it for yourself. So what will often happen, I see it in my own children, is like you can impart as much wisdom as you want to. Somebody just has to get knocked around and try things out. And that's okay. That's what I mean about the leaning in. Like 
you can get as much wisdom as possible from other people, but don't let the wisdom be the reason why you won't do something. Like that's the silliest thing, you know. Abandon your, you know, open your heart to different things and let let the wisdom that you acquire in your life be the actual authentic wisdom and not necessarily just what you acquire from others. I think it's important to acquire wisdom from others, but it's also important to live it and gain it for yourself. Absolutely. I, I mean, Lule, really, you covered it perfectly and, and exactly, um, uh, you know, my sentiments exactly is, is how you've um, articulated it. And uh, I think, but the most important thing is also always to do what you love, not only because of the money uh, that you think is involved in it or the prestige or so forth, because um, trust me, uh, when people hear attorneys, they think, uh, you know, whether these multimillionaires <laughs> and far from it. So if anybody goes into law school or tries to do something just for the money or the prestige, uh, you're never going to be happy. Um, so just listen to yourself, do what you like to do. And uh, when you're young, like Lule said, don't be afraid to fail when you're young, because that's when you learn, that's when you explore. And that's when you really find your true calling. And uh, and just to never be afraid to go out into the world and uh, do your best and reach out for help as well from people that you you think could mentor you. Thank you. I'm, I'm taking a lot of mental notes. <laughs> I should have uh, brought some notebook. There's just so much wisdom. And uh, thankfully, this is recorded, so we can rewatch this <laughs> over and over. That's there. So my my absolute last question, because honestly, I could keep going on and on and on with you both, but I'm gonna be respectful of time. So my last question, um, within the past like year, I think self care has been like the buzzword. Everyone's like, oh, self care this. I just how I self care. How do you take care of yourselves um, outside of like work? I mean, we're in the middle of a pandemic, um, still in quarantine. Some of us are in quarantine. So what, what does self care look like for both of you? And we can start with uh, Lule. Um, I mean, sometimes I'm failing at it for sure. <laughs> so sometimes self-care is just being okay that I fail at it. Um, but ultimately, you know, I, I have a few things I do. I, I meditate a lot. Um, it keeps me centered and um, I have the ability to consume a lot of change and a lot of stress because I do that. I am really present for family things. So, you know, the, like when I log out now, I go and cook for my family because that's my job for the day. Um, and we sit at the dinner table and we talk about our day and what happened. So just really being present for the moment. Um, I may not have all the time in the world to spend with my children, but when I do, I am very present um, and making sure that, that that is something I practice. And then, you know, I'm a little bit of a person that needs to go inwards to get a little bit of self-care even though I can connect with people and I can be outwardly bound, I, I actually get a lot of the, the energy reboot when I have my own time. And so I try to do that as well, whether it's, you know, taking a walk or uh, stepping out for a little bit or doing something that just lets me sort of just be one with nature and just be um, connected with in a way that doesn't have me overly stimulated in every way. Yeah, definitely. Uh, hands down, meditation has been my self-care. Um, and it's really helped me to, to be able to uh, focus uh, in terms of uh, when I'm, you know, cooped up in, in at home all the time where work has become, work and home has really kind of commingled for me in a sense, because I wake up, first thing I do is I just walk into uh, down the corridor, go to the, the next room and then get on that computer. And then you get engrossed in what you're doing and you're there the whole day and the files are still there. So you tend to forget your yourself and the time that you need. So what I have tried to do as much as I can, even though I fail at it a lot at times, is to really set that work hour for myself, even though I'm working from home a lot, where I say, okay, by five, six, or by seven, I just have to stop because I, I have to realize I started much earlier than I would have if I, if I had commuted. Uh, but taking the time, whether it's five minutes, 10 minutes throughout the day uh, to stop, pause, meditate. And then I found myself really hiking, um, even though I don't do it as much as I do, I, I was, I want to do it or, or as often, 
but trying to remember to do that, to go out. It doesn't mean that, yes, uh, we can't travel. Yes, we can't associate, uh, I mean, be with family and be able to visit family and be in that crowd that for me, uh, missing family time is huge. That That's always been my self-care was the time that I spent with family and friends. So not being able to have that has really been very difficult. But it's just remembering to maybe do a Zoom call with uh, friends and uh, or uh, really taking a time to breathe and to meditate has has been huge and and to walk. Yeah, th yeah so both of you both said of you meditation. Said Tomorrow, you and I gotta start meditating because we, we got. <laughs> I've been trying. I just have a really hard time focusing, but I, I will continue to try. <laughs> So yeah, so meditation, get moving, and being present, connecting with family and friends. Um, I think those are all things that uh, are doable for a lot I, of You know, I can't overstress the meditation piece because if we have ambition in our career, by definition, ambition requires stress. It just, it invites stress. There's no, there's no way around rising, thriving in a career without having stress come into it. And you can either burn yourself out because of that, or you can learn how to harness that energy and channel it in a way that actually allows you to relish the struggle, to relish the moment. Um, I'm telling you, like, I cannot stress it more, like the power of meditation to get take you back your power and not be stressed constantly, even though you are in stressful situations is really amazing. And trust me, you cannot focus all the time. Yeah. Even when I'm meditating, I'm not focusing at times. I have to pull myself back. Yeah. But it's that, it could be that one minute or something that at least you were able to think about just breathing and uh, having that little moment that really helps. It makes a difference. I'm sure. I'm sure it does. It does. <laughs> This is, this is perfect. Yeah, we're definitely going to have to look into that for some programs. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both so much for joining us today. We cannot like say how much we are honored to have you both. Appreciate the time you took out to share your experiences with us. Um, our, I know that our viewers are going to be very excited to get their hands on this episode. So thank you so much. Um, and uh, we look forward to hosting you ladies again, potentially in the future for uh, things down the line but thank you it was my pleasure and nice to meet you all nice to meet you take care have a good evening have a good thank evening you. thank you ladies and thank you for giving us this opportunity absolutely, absolutely.